Okay, there's just a couple of people coming in, and I think we can get underway. Uh, so, welcome to the Business Mechanics Born Identity. And so this presentation is about uh, designing large-scale identity management solutions. And I'm going to talk about, uh, in the context of Forefront, Identity Manager and ADFS. First, a little bit about me. Um, I uh, started my career in the, in the middle of the 80s at uh, New Zealand Post Office, and uh, I was employed there as a, as a programmer writing COBOL, or back then it was more debugging COBOL code. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, the, uh, the big change to uh, um, telecom. Um, I went the telecom route and stayed doing the same thing. Uh, but uh, decided that wasn't really where I wanted to, to be in my career. Um, I went to uh, Ernst & Young after that and uh, was employed as a consultant. And the, uh, that got me into systems implementations and um, one of the big implementations I did was for the Department of Internal Affairs uh, and that uh, obviously started my interest in some of the identity things. Um, then we're sort of into the 90s and uh, com PC computers and uh, networks became the, the in thing. So I got involved in that and uh, set up some, uh, some interesting um, networks for uh, some government departments and um, the uh, Parliamentary Council Office and the uh, Office of the Clerk of the House of Representatives and some, of the, uh, some people who are really interested in securing their, their information and uh, so security became a, um, a big part of my, my existence there. Um, and then at uh, the turn of the millennium I uh, left Ernst & Young and started Business Mechanics. Um, so working at uh, some other large organisations, the DHBs, um, the Navy. Um, for the Navy, I uh, um, designed and set up their ship-to-shore email solution. Um, so that was over some satellite communications or whatever communications they had available. Um, so that was kind of an interesting piece of work. And then I um, was contracted to uh, to Wintech for uh, a good chunk of time, uh, just part time, uh, doing the, doing a lot of work around their strategy, uh, how to take their IT from where it was in the in the dark ages with uh, whiteboards and overhead projectors, uh, through to being now one of the leading institutes of technology in terms of the way they use technology, and so they're a good example. Um, so, born identity. Uh, I think the the key thing that um, uh, that I want to talk about today is that uh, you really should have one identity to one person, and how how you treat that inside your systems and connect your systems together to share that one identity to um, only have that. Um, it's obviously, uh, as Jason Bourne would say, you know, how can I forget about you if you're know, the only person I know? So one identity is the key thing. We're going to talk about identity management solutions inside large organisations and, and the things that you need to look at to design them. Uh, then we're going to look at a couple of case studies of uh, how it's been implemented in, in some fairly big environments. So one of the things that uh, we need to understand first is what is it that businesses want? What is it that end users are looking for? Uh, so they, obviously they'll give you these things like a simple user experience. Yeah? So what does that mean? Um, they want self-service. Well, how do we, how do we uh, give them self-service and self-service for what? Uh, they want to be able to access any application that they they should be able to access uh, from anywhere that they want, whether it's inside or outside your network. They want this access. They want uh, 
seamless movement between applications. They don't want to be prompted to log in every time that they go from one application to another. They, uh, when they log in, they want to log in once and have access to everything. And again, inside the, the, the um, network or outside the network, it doesn't matter to them. So we've got the role of empowering the business and giving them these things. But of course, there's, there's this other thing that IT departments need, and that is to control. Uh, you've got to actually control access to um, systems because you've got to secure them. And you, you need to only extend parts of, or uh, in a controlled way, extend access to these resources. You can't just open them up on the internet and let everybody have full access to them because they're not going to last long. You've got to enable um, access to a lot of disparate systems, and you've got to be able to support these new buzzwords like BYOD. And so how, how can you treat these other devices that are coming into your environment as though, uh, as though they're a part of your environment? Um, so we, we need tools that are going to provide that. We also, when we're dealing in large environments, we're dealing with large numbers of users. We need to automate how we do all of this. So we have to automate prov uh, provisioning the accounts for these people and deprovisioning them when they don't have access anymore. So we've got to... Um, all of the information that we know about these people have to flow between the different systems that we have. And we've got to come up with a solution and it doesn't, it's not going to be the, uh, the chain link fence solution that people are used to doing. Because we know if you put in a partial border around your organisation, uh, people find ways to climb the chain link fence. It's, uh, then you put some barbed wire around the top of the fence and they'll still find a way to scale over. They'll put a blanket over it or something and, and get over it. It's, uh, if you come at it from... Uh, the perspective of keeping people controlling them and uh, uh, keeping them inside or keeping your systems protected by putting this chain link fence around it, then you're actually um, uh, closing all of that, all of that uh, opportunity that you have to provide the, uh, the, the things that the business, the end users actually want. So we need to, we need to look at access management and that's, uh, you've probably heard of that as a term that's been used quite a bit at the uh, conference at the TechEd so far. The, we, need to, we need to break that down and say, OK, you've got to have self-service group management. Whether somebody's a member of a group or not, uh, they need to be able to request access to it, have somebody approve that, and then have them put into that group without having to go through IT. So you've got to provide a portal to them that uh, they can do all of these requests and, and the approvals can happen, and more so in a large environment, that is, uh, that's critical. And of course, one of the key things that um, the end users do constantly is forget passwords. So you've got to deal with how you're, how you're doing password resets, and that, again, becomes self-service. Um, so you need a, a tool to provide password reset functionality in a secure way. You can't, you can't rely on um, uh, knowing everything you need to know about that person who is, um, who's asking for that password to be reset because that person may or may not be uh, known to you. You could be dealing with 60,000, 100,000, 200,000 people. You don't necessarily know them all personally. So you have to have rules that uh, you put in place to tell you how, how much access people can have, whether you trust them, why you trust them uh, to reset their passwords and things like that. So it's, do you know something about them like their mobile phone number? And can you send them a text to that mobile phone number with a code that they supply back to you? And is that good enough to, uh, to then allow them to reset their password? 
when, you, when you're dealing with um, a lot of different businesses that uh, these days uh, join, in, join together in partnerships and have, at a business level, some trust between them. We then have to start looking at identity management uh, extending across business boundaries. So it's not just about uh, um, controlling the user accounts and, and access from within your organisation, it is how you allow other partner organisations to access things and how you, uh, how you control that. And so that's when we start looking at uh, ADFS and, and feder federating between the two organisations. Because ADFS is about trusting and creating trust between the organisations. So if we've got to design a solution to meet all of this, we have to start off working out what it is that's flowing. And what do we have? We've got a HR system with lots of information in it about our staff. So that's one of our data sources, and then we want to, uh, because they exist in the HR system, we want to give them access to something. But that's not the only place. We'll probably have a customer system of some sort, and that'll have all of the identities of our customers. And we need to consolidate all of this, and, and uh, when a, a person exists in the HR system as an employee, but they also exist in the customer system as a customer, we have to work out how we deal with that in their consolidated view. And once we have that consolidated, we can then use that to create an account in Active Directory, something like that. So that's a very high level view and a, and a little bit of an example that I might delve into a little bit more now. Let's look at the customer system and you end up with a lot of different attributes about a customer, but you don't necessarily, necessarily need all of those to be able to uh, create an account in Active Directory. But we have a consolidated view which will have all of those account, uh, all of those attributes plus more. And then we need to match between our customer system and our consolidated view which attribute flows to which attribute. We also need to think about um, uh, when we have another system with slightly different named attributes, do they map to the, uh, the same thing inside the consolidated view and do we need to transform what they, what they are as they are mapping? So then once we get them into the consolidated view, we need to look at what we need to supply to Active Directory to create that person. So in some, in some instances, you're going to take the, uh, a different attribute, and so I'm showing here preferred name instead of first name, and we're going to push that into the appropriate field in Active Directory for given name. So we're not just doing a direct one-to-one -one mapping here. We're actually saying, yes, we're collecting all of this information together, but we're using the information for what we want it to go to. So if you're designing a large-scale solution, you've got a lot of these different attributes that you need to flow, and you need to work out what your source data is and where you have to flow it to. And one of the other things you have to think about is if you've got that same person existing in two systems, when they come into the consolidated view, uh, do, is, it the, is it the first name that you're getting from the customer system or the first name from the HR system that takes precedence when it comes into the, uh, into the consolidated view? Well, who owns, the, who's the authoritative source for that attribute? And you can do that at an attribute by attribute level. Because in the consolidated view, the, the, the attribute that, uh, that wins, that is the authoritative attribute, is the one that's stored in the consolidated view. So if you don't have a first name for somebody in your customer system for some reason, but you've been able to match them to the same person in the HR system, then it will populate a first name for them in 
the, uh, and, and the consolidated view. So when you're looking at your different data sources, how you build that consolidated view of them is really important. Uh, it's a, the, the biggest part of getting the design right. So you, you, get the, um, uh, you get those flows and you work out what precedence you, you need to have for each attribute at an attribute level. You may also have a different attribute flowing uh, at the, that, are, that is the original attribute that originates uh, something. So it could have uh, a first name coming from the, um, from the HR system as the, in the first flow, and that's your initial flow, but then from then on, if, uh, if somebody puts a, um, uh, a different first name in the customer system, we want that to flow in. So you can have a different originating flow to the ongoing. So then when we're looking at, uh, at FIM, we're, we're saying what parts of FIM are we going to use? So you, you decide the functionality. If we look at profile management, profile management is about creating that user identity. So you create an account. Then you've got group management. So you, once you've created the person, you need to say which group should they be in. And so that, that's a completely separate function. Then we look at credential management. So with credential management, you have uh, certificates or smart cards or uh, multi-factor authentication. All of the, these things can be handled in a, in a separate function. I don't know if you've heard of the Behold add-on for, uh, for FIM, but it is a roles-based um, man, uh, account management. So, so you can provide people access to certain, um, certain resources based on where they sit in the organisation structure. So in Behold, you can map out your organisation structure and say if they're in this department and they are a manager level uh, and have financial responsibilities and all that sort of stuff, then they can have access to these financial reports that are available in this part of the portal. So you can start mapping out what people can have access to based on the different parts of the organisation that they're in without having to put them into, in, in and out of groups. So that way when somebody changes jobs and it gets updated in the HR system, the access actually flows through, um, as, through the, uh, the behold so, side of it and that actually moves them out of that part of the organisation structure and into a different part of the organisation structure uh, and they get access to what they should have for their new job but not, and it gets taken away for their old job. You can have both. So you can, you can have the uh, group management automated and, and based on the organisation structure, but you can also have the self-service groups um, and, and that could be a distribution list group. So you could say in, uh, if you're having a, if you've got a, let's say a, a distribution list that you want for your cricket team, and anybody who's interested in when the cricket games are can just automatically request that and be allowed access to it and then be part of that email distribution that goes out saying the next cricket game is, is here. Um, that side of it you can still have and you can map um, the organisation structural uh, group management, if you like, access management, and behold. Um, the other part of it is uh, uh, password management. So FIM has a, um, a function called PCNS, or Password Change Notification Service. And the way that that works is when you have a, a password being changed in Active Directory, say, uh, before it gets encrypted by Active Directory, it can be uh, intercepted by PCNS and pulled into FIM and then dispersed out to other systems. 
And that way you can have the same password stored in all of your systems. And you can have a common password used to access all systems. So that's one thing. If you have federation, you don't need that. But if, you don't, if you're not able to federate with a system, at least having the same password for that user in that system is probably a good idea. Um, so then we, we look at uh, the different parts of FIM. And, and it all sits on SQL Server, which is convenient. There's a, uh, a FIM sync service, and that controls the moving of attributes and passwords, and, and that's where everything flows through and synchronizes between all of the different systems. And the, uh, on, there's a, a SharePoint-based um, portal and uh, FIM service um, engine, and that is, um, I'll just, uh, here's an example of what it looks like. So we have a, um, uh, a place in here for your distribution groups and your security groups. This is an administrator's view of it, um, but we, if you're just an, an end user, you can be given access to a lot of this. Uh, in, the, uh, in the users section, you can look at your own profile. If you're administrator, you get to look at all of the users. You can delegate control to different people in your organization and say, okay, well, finance department, you can look after people that are going in and out of finance groups, and if, if you want to request, um, or handle all of the requests for that, then you handle that, and we won't need to know. And when you approve it, we're just going to process it through. Can the source be a CSV? Or? Yes. Yeah, so you, there's multiple different sources. Um, I'll cover that off shortly. Um, the, uh, probably the, the, the next big thing that I'm going to talk about, though, is the management policy rules. That area is where you, um, that's, that's the FIM service part of it, and that's where you configure um, the attribute flows and everything. So you start off, you create a management policy rule, and that, that rule, policy rule is based on a set. And so you'll have... Um, a set will be something like all users or all finance users or all users in this location or that sort of thing. So you define your set and the management policy rule is based on people coming in and out of those, uh, those sets. And then when somebody does come in and out of those sets, it runs a workflow. And the workflow is going to kick off a synchronization rule, which is handled by the sync engine. So the, um, the types of things that the synchronization rules do is provision, so that's creating new. It does a join, so that is, uh, if, it's, if it already knew about it from another source, it actually connects to it, and rather than creating it as an as a additional thing, it joins them together. And then it also can flow different attributes in different directions. So then we look at our data sources. So obviously with the Active Directory, you can be dealing with multiple forests, uh, multiple domains, and definitely multiple organization units. And so with FIM, you can actually move people based on certain rules from one organization unit to another which could be from active to deleted. Um, it could be um, from one domain to another, or it could be from one forest to another. Or by having somebody created uh, in, in one data source, you can actually push out to multiple forests, multiple domains, and multiple OUs around the place. So you can set up quite comp complicated rules of where you want these uh, these accounts created. <coughs> you can uh, connect your, a, to a data source, which is a SQL Server database, an Oracle database, or lots of others, MySQL. Um, you can also have web services. So you can connect to a web service and have that as your source for data, or push out to a web service 
to tell it to create an account. CSV files or any sort of delimited text file um, that, uh, that you want to specify. And I've put passwords in there because um, passwords aren't exactly a different data source, but uh, they're a, they have to be treated differently when you are syncing them around all of your data sources. Like, uh, you're probably not going to want to put a uh, password in a, out, out to a text file and leave it sitting somewhere in an uh, unencrypted clear text. So you've got to actually take that into consideration when you're designing these solutions as well. And then we've got to look at the scale of uh, what we're dealing with. So inside a, a large organisation, you might have a thousand users, but you might have 50,000 uh, customers. Therefore, you're dealing with all of those and creating accounts for all of them to access your resources. Then you've got to look at how many groups you have. So if you've got um, 150 different groups and each group might have um, 20 to 1,000 um, accounts and members inside that group, then you're starting to deal with some large amounts of data that you're managing. So if you had to do this manually and know that you had the right people in each group for that number of groups, it's going to take somebody or a team of people a lot of time to keep that up to date. And especially when you've got people leaving and you need them removed out of all of the groups that they were in and uh, deactivated properly or Worse is when they're just changing roles. How do you know which of them are still valid and which need to be? There's a whole lot of business rules in behind it that you've got to um, step through as well. And then for each of the data sources, we have at least one management agent. And I say at least one because uh, you might have a separate management agent configured to do the users to, uh, and then have another one for dealing with the groups and putting them in and out of groups. And that is for, one, for each of your data sources. And then, of course, when you're dealing with large numbers, you've got, a, uh, you've got to look at the initial population from all of these data sources. You've got to understand the, uh, what's going to happen when you're putting this in and you've got an existing Active Directory that's got existing users in it. Which attributes are you going to change on those users? Can you join to them? Because were they created with the, with the appropriate business rules? And have, do they have the right naming conventions? Um, so do you have an account name convention, which is the, uh, the surname, or, and then the first letter of the, their first name, and then a number? Um, is it the first three letters of the first name and the first three letters of the surname and then a number? I've seen lots of different ones, but I haven't really seen one that uh, uh, even when you use their full name, you still run into uh, duplicates and you invariably see a number at the end. If you look at Microsoft, uh, you, you see all of the different combinations and they allow all of them. There's no rule in how they assign a username. It's, uh, as long as it's unique, they, uh, they let them have it, and it is, uh, could be first name and then the, uh, the, the first initial of their surname, or it, if that's not unique, it could be the, the first two letters in their surname, or it could be their first, uh, their first initial and their whole surname, whatever, they, they just come up with something that's unique. So having rules around how you're doing it for large volumes of people become quite, quite critical. And obviously with Microsoft, they have some way of assigning it and making it unique. And uh, if you've been there long enough or you're senior enough, you get to, to choose how, how you want to be called. Right. So. We've got, uh, we've got to populate it, we've got to look at uh, the load, 
and the load is uh, what are the peak times? Do you have uh, a lot of customers onboarding at the same time? Uh, what's that going to do with your processing? Are you going to be able to keep up? Uh, do we have everyone in this room that we created account for like that? Uh, probably not going to be that difficult. But if there was 10,000, maybe that's a little bit harder. It's going to take a bit longer. We have to look at uh, how many different connectors or management agents um, we're dealing with because each of them has to run and it's probably going to run three or four different um, run profiles and it's going to take time to run each one. Any, any connector that needs to do an export, which is when it creates the users, those ones take longer. And we've got to look at um, uh, can we actually run some of these concurrently? Because that, uh, that's one way of making things go a lot quicker. Um, and that sort of came out with, uh, with uh, FIM 2012, as the, um, uh, sorry, 2010. You can actually uh, run your management agents at the same time on different data sources. Whereas, go back to the previous version, the ILM, Identity Lifecycle Manager, you could only run them one at a time. So the main difference is it is now a 64-bit environment and it can handle running multiple threads. You also have to look at password changes because that's something that it actually needs to handle quite immediately and, and push that around because those things, you're not going to schedule that to happen every 15 minutes or every hour or every day. You want that to happen straight away. Then we've got to look at single sign-on. So when we're looking at, um, uh, at that, that means that you sign in once and you have access to all of the different systems. So we don't want to be going from one system to another and it popping up asking for another login. So single sign-on um, these days means federation. Um, so that means ADFS. So with, with ADFS, you can, uh, when you log in and authenticate against AD once on your, on your network, it can then, any application you go to that's federated, it can, uh, when you go to that application, it uh, checks with ADFS, ADFS says yeah, he's already signed in and gives a token back and you use that token for the uh, uh, access into that application. So that means that you're, um, you're, you're gaining uh, this, this uh, single sign-on. When you're outside the organisation and you haven't already authenticated with AD, you just get that uh, one-time authentication and then inside your whole browser, until you close your browser, you actually keep that, uh, uh, that session going with ADFS and you just keep using that same token over and over doesn't matter which application you're going in and out of. So that's quite a, uh, um, quite a good benefit. But of course you've got, that works really well with web-based applications uh, and it works really well with applications that support uh, Kerberos and other types of uh, claims-based authentication. Anything that you can actually federate with. And of course, now with the, uh, the uh, Windows Server 2012 R2, we get the uh, web app proxy. Um, that's a new feature that's come out that means that you can um, present applications uh, that might have uh, uh, non-claims-based non authentication applications. It could be forms-based authentication, things like that. You can present them out um, through ADFS to uh, handle the uh, a um, single sign-on as well. Microsoft have quite a few products that uh, work with um, ADFS. Obviously Windows Server, um, Exchange or Office 365, um, that, uh, that's a very common one. Dynamics CRM, Dynamics Nav uh, and SharePoint um, all supported. 
There's also other Federation products out there that ADFS works with. So all you really need to be doing is setting trusts up with them and configuring what it wants to see passed to it and, and, what, and when you uh, receive something back you need to know how to uh, unencrypt it and, and deal with that token as well. So when you're designing your federation architecture, there's a few things to look at. Um, in terms of ADFS, we have a federation server and we have a federation proxy server. So the proxy you tend to put in your DMZ and that uh, um, passes requests through to the federation server. It doesn't actually um, do any of the federation itself, it's just a proxy just passes through. The federation server communicates with your directory, Active Directory server and, it, uh, and that's how you get access to applications. You probably want to look at uh, load balancing um, because if you're passing all of your authentication through ADFS you're probably going to need more than one server in your large organisations. Uh, so that would be more than one proxy server. You're probably going to have more than one AD server already and you're probably going to need more than one federation server. Inside your organisation you're going to have the requests handled directly by the federation server. They won't go out to the proxy. But you can put proxies on the inside as well if you want to direct them to that as well. It's not a lot of point though. It's a uh, Microsoft's standard is to do the load balancing of ADFS with uh, NLB and if anyone's used that you probably uh, probably know that it's uh, uh, one of those things that uh, either works or it doesn't and um, so there's a lot of products like um, um, F5 have a uh, uh, that, that's a really good load balancer. Um, it's hard, a hardware appliance that um, has a um, very configurable um, engine in it that uh, is really good at uh, load balancing. But there's loads of different load balancer products out there. I tend to suggest that if you're in a large organisation you will be using a, one of these appliances rather than uh, using NLB. So just to uh, quickly sum up on the dis different design components, we have to remember about um, the attribute flows and we have to go through the uh, setting the precedence for the attribute flows. Uh, so that means we need to understand uh, which one owns that, which system owns is the owner of that attribute and has precedence when it goes into the, um, into the central consolidated view. We have to work out which parts of FIM we're going to use and that obviously depends on uh, uh, which bits we install. Whether you can actually configure FIM without having the SharePoint components and just use the sync engine. And that actually has a different licensing model as well. So if you're just using the sync service you don't have to have a CAL license for each of the users. It's only if you're using the SharePoint part of it. You need to understand the scale and how many users and groups and things you've, you're dealing with. You've got to work out which data sources you are, um, you're, where you're getting the data from and where it's going to. You've got to plan your initial population, sort out your loading and design your, fe your federation architecture. I'm going to ask uh, Courtney to uh, uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, a mission that she has. All right, so today I was given a mission and that mission was to collect all your identities. Um, so you got given this card. So could you please fill out the form? I've got about 15 that have come through to my email, so um, I am collecting them. 
We will be doing a draw um, just after the next case study where Linda will be giving out heaps of prizes. Um, and on the other side, don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn. And we are offering some PowerShell training on the 25th and 26th of September. So if anyone's interested, do you want to come and talk to us and we can give you some more information. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so I'm just going to um, jump into a case study on Eastern Institute of Technology. Um, so EIT is uh, based in Hawke's Bay. They have over 150 programs, which means 150 groups, because there's a direct translation from a pr program being in, uh, part of a program to being a member of a group. They have over 60,000 students and alumni, and all of their students and alumni have a, an active AD account, and they have an active Office 365 mailbox and can keep using that. They're using ADFS to federate with, uh, um, with Office 365, so they, all of the authentication is handled by their Active Directory on campus. So they've, they have different locations as well, and that means that uh, there's a whole lot of attributes that uh, need to flow, and one of them that they're flowing is the location. Most of their attributes actually uh, are pretty direct flows. The display name is one that's calculated as first name plus a space plus the last name. Uh, everything else is actually quite straightforward. But what we've, uh, what we've set up for them is when a student enrolls in their student system, it is, uh, it is seen by FIM and it creates a, an account for them in their printing, print account system, so that's for their photocopying and, and printing and that sets in a, an initial bal uh, account balance for them. And then we flow that out to Active Directory and create an account in Active Directory for them. And all of the attributes that we know about the student flow out to Active Directory. We put a, um, uh, a, pas a password reset portal in for them, which is a separate one to FIM. That's a, a separate one that we built for them. Uh, that one uses some of the information from, uh, from their student system, like their, mo their mobile phone number, uh, date of birth, and that's, uh, that information is exposed to that, that password reset system so that it uh, uh, confirms the identity of the user and before it allows them to uh, reset their password. And we, we also have a second implementation of FIM, which is known as Dersync. So Dersync is a cut-down version of FIM. So they've removed a lot of the additional functionality that FIM has. It is just the sync engine of FIM, and it only supports uh, connecting to um, your Active Directory on-premise and Active Directory in the cloud, and that's all it does. So, the, so Microsoft have made Dersync into a black box that you can install it and it just flows things through and you don't need to worry about uh, anything that it does. It just, just trusts that it happens. So once they get out into the Active Directory then uh, that create, in, in Azure, that creates their accounts in Office 365. So I guess the, uh, what we've set up for this is uh, you have the, the central FIM sync engine, the sync service. It's retrieving the users through one management agent from, a, from the, the student management system, Artina. It's also all of their courses and, and programs and, and whether that student should be in that group. That's another management agent. Papercut is their print account system and it's uh, got that two-way um, information going there. 
The FIM service, the SharePoint portal, we actually use the, the FIM sync engine uh, pushes out to separate database for the SharePoint portal, and that's how that works. And that's a two-way. So when you're creating your synchronization rules and your uh, management policy rules and sets and everything like that, you're setting it in here, and it is updating uh, the information in the FIM sync engine and telling the FIM sync engine what to do. So then we uh, um, create the accounts in Active Directory, and DERSYNC sees that they've been created and pushes them out to the Azure, Azure AD and uh, creates them for Office 365. So the Federation, they've got their Active Directory servers inside their network. They've got a Federation server um, and out in that federates with the Azure Active Directory servers in the, in the cloud and gives them access to Office 365. Just before we head into the next case study, Courtney's going to draw some prizes. Okay, so I've got about 26 on my phone, so I'm just going to randomly go through. Um, Aaron Sanson. Sanson, put your hand up. Anyone? Oh, window's going off. Okay. Next one we'll choose is James Kelly. James Kelly. Hand up. No. Gone. All right. Okay. Um, if you know him, tell him he's a loser. <laughs> um, Peter Brook. Just over here. <coughs> and we'll do one more. Uh, Graham Hurd. Just over there, and we'll do one last one for those who haven't filled it out. Um, yeah, there's still time. So if you uh, fill out your entries, then uh, uh, we'll do another draw at the end. So Manukau Institute of Technology, um, they, uh, they have over 25,000 students, so they're quite a bit bigger. Um, they're actually current students. They do 1,500 full and part-time degrees, diplomas, certificate courses. So scale-wise, they're quite a lot bigger. They've got about, um, including their alumni, they've got sort of somewhere between 60 and 80,000 um, accounts that, in AD that they're dealing with. When we look at their data sources and their student system feeds uh, into FIM, and they also got a legacy uh, Sun LDAP server, which uh, provides authentication to some of their um, systems. They've got uh, multiple Active Directory um, forests, so they, uh, uh, they have to synchronize out to both of those. And what, what's happening is the ones that are created in here synchronize in and get created in this one as well so that they can be created uh, by DERSYNC in Office 365. So the, this was a historical uh, separate campus that wasn't connected by a, uh, um, a uh, wide area network at the time, so it was put into a separate forest. So, I mean, that's pretty, pretty much what I've just said. So we'll probably skip past that. Their federation architecture, they've got... Um, uh, they've, they're using the federation proxy in the DMZ. So they're a little bit different to EIT in that respect. But even though the volume of students that they're dealing with, they haven't actually required the load balancing of the, uh, the Federation proxy or the Federation server. So just to, you're supposed to be able to handle 500 concurrent or, um, authentications with a uh, Federation server, which is quite a lot. And 
you can imagine that when everybody turns up at the start of the day, if you've got tens of thousands of people, you could quite easily get over 500 um, at once. But they haven't found that as a, as a problem yet, so they're just keeping an eye on that. So as we uh, um, sum up, and um, before we do the next draw, I hope you've uh, all filled out your, your entries. Just uh, quickly, the um, attribute flows decide which parts of the, uh, the tool you're going to use, because you don't have to use them all, they're all optional. Work out which parts of, uh, of FIM you want to use, and whether, you, whether or not you want to uh, use the, the portal and allow the, the self-service functionality. Uh, and if you don't, then you don't need to pay for the user cows for all of your um, identities that you have in the system. <coughs> have a look at uh, the volumes so that you can work out uh, your loading and uh, do any performance tuning you need. Look at your uh, data sources. What is it you're connecting to? What a, what a, what's flowing in or out of that data source? whether you need multiple management agents for that data source. How are you going to do your initial population? So that's about uh, uh, populating the FIM tool as well as populating that data, the, the outbound data sources. So that, uh, that when you connect out to Active Directory and you're creating accounts in Active Directory, you want to be making sure you're joining to anything that's already there rather than creating an additional one. The, uh, the different uh, things that impact your performance, like the, the quantity of connectors you have, in, the, uh, how many, uh, what you're dealing with is peak times, and uh, whether you can do any performance tuning. Um, there's some, some tricks around whether you're connecting to a view in your data source or whether you're connecting to a table directly as to uh, how fast it's going to run. The, whether you can run any of your uh, processing on your data sources uh, concurrently saves you uh, uh, quite a bit of time if you're trying to fit in all of your runs to happen overnight. Uh, and then uh, designing your federation architecture. So really we're talking about um, how we can create a single identity and flow it around multiple systems and keep it all in sync. And uh, I guess the question that uh, Marie asked Jason at the end of the Born Identity was, do you have ID? And uh, I'm asking, do you have identity management? All right, so Courtney's going to draw some more uh, prizes. I've got a few more in that, in that break. So the next one I'm going to pull out is Paul Macaron. Did I pronounce that right? Just over there. Cool. The next one I will do is Richard Coggins. Richard Coggins, just over there. Um, the next one I will do is Sid Patel. Patel. How many have we got more? Just one, one more? Sure. Lucky last. Okay. And I've got Klim Belchev. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cool. So if you have questions about uh, the setup at MIT, you probably want to ask Klim. <laughs> I've talked about the, uh, the design that we put together for MIT. And, uh, of course, things change as, as they're implemented, and uh, they change over time as well. But it's not too far off that. Right, well, I'm going to be uh, outside uh, the ballrooms here for the next hour or so. Um, so if you've got questions that uh, you want to touch base with me, I'll just come and find me out there. 
Um, otherwise, uh, you can email me at wayne at mechanics.co.nz.